Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, I'd like to talk to you today about uh, Computer Go, which is a specific uh, branch of AI related to game playing. And Go is one of the, or used to be one of the uh, very difficult games, very big challenges in AI, uh, where humans were much better than, uh, than, uh, than computers until recently, until efforts uh, uh, of the AlphaGo team, which is part of DeepMind uh, of Google, and uh, uh, yeah, recently they released a paper and I'd like to talk to you about it and uh, also about the problem itself because I think it's pretty interesting and has a lot of overlaps uh, in different directions. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -mm. Ah, okay. So, uh, just briefly about me. Uh, Maybe you remember me from some uh, some previous machine learning meetups where I talked mostly about natural language processing, about knowledge bases, about question answering, uh, information extraction, and topics like that. Uh, but uh, actually, before that, before I started working on that, uh, I was working in this field of uh, computer Go, which is I, why I feel slightly qualified to talk about uh, what AlphaGo did. Uh, so. Uh, in the past, what I actually did as also as my master's thesis is uh, program Pachi, which then used to be the strongest computer go problem, which uh, computer go program which was open source. Uh, it wasn't the strongest in the world, but among the open source ones, it was the strongest. Which is was it was basically a traditional uh, engine which wasn't using any neural networks, just traditional approaches uh, in that time. Uh, that means Monte Carlo research and Monte Carlo simulations, and it was pretty strong and popular. And uh, then I ran out of ideas how to improve it, so uh, uh, I moved to different areas, uh, but uh uh, I did some more work in the area just very briefly uh, because uh, I, I created an educational minimalistic program called Michi, which is in 550 lines of Python code, basically the essence of Computer Go at that time. Uh, that was before the release of AlphaGo and the powerful neural networks, which changed everything back then. Uh, but uh, when the AlphaGo paper, Zero paper came out, I actually also re-implemented that uh, within Michi, and that uh, the program is called Nochi. I'll come back to it later. But uh, it's a re-implementation of the AlphaGo Zero algorithm. And yeah, otherwise right now I am a founder and uh, CTO of uh, uh, Rosum AI, which is Prague startup, which does artificial intelligence uh, uh, in the area of documents and document processing. So what we will talk about today. Uh, a month ago in the scientific na uh, journal Nature, uh, uh, the AlphaGo team of DeepMind published paper called Mastering the Game of Go Without Human Knowledge. And uh, uh, before, basically a year and a half before that, uh, the AlphaGo team was pretty famous because it, uh, it published uh, uh, the f f first superhuman program, uh, which was stronger than the human players in the area of Go, which surprised everyone because up until, the, until then, everyone expected this to take another 10 years to maybe beat the humans. And suddenly, they just did it. And uh, they used some pretty innovative approaches. And uh, uh, this paper, which was uh, uh, published just a month ago, is pretty interesting because uh, it's the strongest AlphaGo version ever. It's much stronger than even the previous version, but it needs a lot less computational power. And it's actually really simple compared to the previous program. It's, uh, if you read it and understand the field, you are able to basically re-implement that over the night, which I actually did at that day. And uh, then I did a week of debugging, but the basics were. <laughs> So, uh, what's interesting about this, what means without no human knowledge, aside of the fact that it's much simpler, uh, it's trained completely from scratch, uh, without any supervision. Uh, that means the past programs, basically they still relied on a lot of human knowledge, because uh, they used a lot of handcrafted features on the input of the neural networks, and they also were trained on records of uh, games between very strong human players. So the program was building on top of this knowledge, but uh, this one actually uses no human knowledge. There is no... Uh, handcrafted features, the input of the neural network is just 
the same thing that a human sees when looking at the board, essentially. And uh, there is no supervision from past human games. The network starts playing completely randomly and trains just by self-play, playing against uh, itself. And basically it builds all, the, all its understanding of the game of Go from scratch. Um, and yeah, it's even stronger, much stronger than the strongest human now. So uh, what I'll talk about today is uh, I'll give some brief introduction to the game of Go. Uh, then we'll talk about how to apply neural networks to this game. Then uh, how to make uh, the game tree search actually work in this game, which, is, uh, which has a lot of branching. It's more, much more complicated than, for example, chess in this regard. And then we'll put this all together and describe how AlphaGo Zero actually works and how it trains itself. And then briefly, I'll mention what to do if you want to replicate this, uh, this approach. So um, uh, I wonder uh, who here knows how to play Go or played at least one game of Go? A lot of people, but not everyone. Don't worry if you didn't. I'll explain, I'll explain briefly, but it's great that many people actually tried the game and maybe some of them even liked it. So uh, Go is one of the oldest, uh, it's actually the oldest board game. Uh, it's more than 3,000 years old. And uh, it's a game which is played on a, on a square board, uh, which is actually, uh, it makes a grid of n by n intersections and uh, black and white play, black and white uh, players uh, they put stones of the respective color on the intersections when they place them at some place the stones don't move anymore they stay at that place uh, forever uh, unless they are captured uh, when uh, the enemy player uh, completely surrounds, surrounds the group of stones. And the goal is basically uh, to surround the largest area of the board. And uh, one good way to do that is to actually surround many of uh, the uh, opponent's stones. So uh, who, who wins at the end is the player who has, more, has surrounded more intersections and uh, uh, how they capture the stones. Hmm. This presenter doesn't like me very much. Uh, so uh, basically how this works is uh, uh, if you have a group of connected stones, well, that's called a group. Basically, these stones are all connected by, by lines which go between the stones. And uh, uh, some of the lines go to some free empty positions which aren't occupied uh, by, uh, by the enemy. And uh, those are called liberties. And if the group runs out of liberties, so for example, in this case, this is the last liberty of the group. If the white player plays here, uh, basic, the uh, group is captured, and at that moment, the stones are removed from the board. And uh, uh, this is called also capture, so if I use the word capture, that means this. And if the, there is the last, uh, the, uh, the last liberty, it's called Atari. Maybe I will mention that sometime as well. So, and there is, uh, so that's how capturing works. And there is one last rule, which is the core rule, which basically says, uh, which basically prevents infinite loops. So for example, uh, here in this case, uh, if black player uh, can, can make a move, uh, if, he's, uh, if it's his move, he can play here and capture this white stone. But then it's white's move, the moves are alternating, maybe I didn't mention that. Then, then, then white could play here again and capture the black uh, stone here. And uh, this could loop infinitely, and basically that's prohibited. If uh, uh, the core rule basically says that positions are, uh, that identical positions cannot repeat. So if the other player would, would create an identical position to one before, uh, he cannot make that move and he has to make a different move. So what I just explained are basically the complete rules of the game. So whoever surrounds the most territory wins, and uh, while they place the, move, the stones on the, on the board, they can capture uh, enemy stones by surrounding the groups they make. But, so, so those rules are pretty simple, uh, but uh, there is actually a lot of variation here. 
and a lot of freedom that the players uh, have because at any at any point they can play at any empty intersection on the board basically and uh, so there is a lot of choices at each move about where to play and uh, also what matters a lot is whether the stones actually can can stay alive until the end of the game or if they can be unconditionally captured by the enemy so just a little bit of tactics this isn't raw rules anymore but some very basic basic uh, structures that emerge from those rules uh, so we say uh, let's say that uh, uh, that uh, we have some groups here and we are wondering uh, what is the status of these groups if they uh, can remain on the board until the end of the game or if the opponent can make some moves which actually capture those stones so uh, what would you say about this black group which is almost surrounded but it has like one 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 liberty here so it's still still technically on the board can it can can it be captured or can it can it stay alive until the end of the game? It's not a trick question. Someone is nodding, but I don't know what that means. <laughs> they can be captured. Yeah, they can be captured. If white plays at this point at Y uh, at A, basically those those uh, the, the this group runs out of liberties. And that means it is captured and white player will remove the black stones from the board and be happy. Okay, so what about this group? It already has two liberties. So that's uh, like easier for, for black, right? It's, it can be captured. Okay, how? Okay. Yeah, so, so, so white plays, uh, plays here. And if black wouldn't respond and white would also get another move here, then this black group would uh, run out of liberties and be captured. So black has to capture here the white stone, but at that point the black group has uh, uh, only one liberty uh, anyway, so it can be captured. So, so both of these groups are still on the board technically, but essentially they are dead. And the white player can any time capture them at any moment he chooses, basically. So. Uh, what about, what about, uh, okay, let's do this one first. Uh, what about this black group? What? Yeah, it's alive. There is no possible move for white to capture this black group. Because, like, if white would place, uh, play, play, place, uh, place a stone here, it would be actually uh, suicide, basically, because the white stone would have no liberties. And actually, we prohibit those moves typically because they are kind of useless. They don't change anything because the white stone would have to be removed immediately again. So white cannot play here and he cannot play here either. So he cannot fill both liberties at once, right? So, so, so this black group is alive and this is like complete certainty for, for, for black, it's fine. Okay, so what about this black group, the last one? Okay. Right, so uh, easier variant is if black is to play, uh, if he is not sure about this group, he can just play here and create an identical group to this one, just 90, 90 degrees rotated, right? But if white plays here, the group, the black group is suddenly dead because, uh, uh, because uh, at that point, uh, if black plays at any of these points, he will, uh, the group will actually lose one liberty and have the last liberty and white can capture. And if black doesn't play there, white can play, play here any, uh, any time. And if black captures, uh, basically it's identical to this situation and black will die. So this group is, uh, it depends on who is to play and if white is to play, he can capture this group by playing here. Okay, so th those were just some basic tactics to show that there are a lot of complexity rises, that there is a lot of more complex tactics than this, and a lot of sort of meta rules about how to play well the game, what moves are good, where to play, and so on. And, uh, but because I don't want to bore you too much about that, let, let's move on, let's move on. Uh, let's say that, okay, we understand the basic rules of the game and now we want to uh, build a basic program which solves the game. So uh, one traditional approach is, um, 
is to just build the so-called game tree, which basically is, uh, okay, I make, I make a tree of uh, all the positions which can arise by successive place. So basically at each point I enumerate the, all the possible moves that, uh, this is not go by the way, this is uh, uh, tic-tac-toe, <laughs> uh, just so that you aren't confused. Uh, uh, so, so, so basically at each, uh, at each node you enumerate the, mu the moves that the player to play can make, and then for each of these moves you enumerate the opponent's moves and so on and so on. And uh, then uh, what you are basically doing, it's called so-called so, uh, so minimax decision, that means uh, that uh, that basically, if you if you already know about some positions, uh, if they are good or bad, uh, then basically, uh, let's say that uh, th this position is, uh, uh, yeah, okay, let's say th this position is uh, good for black, then white wants to make a move which is, uh, which is, uh, which which avoids this situation. So so at uh, uh, you have these interleaving decisions. In one of the decision, you want to, uh, to choose a position which has no no which has no move which can uh, bring you to bad position. And at the other level, you want to choose a position where you have any move which can uh, lead you to success. Uh, so for this, basically. Uh, you need to build some kind of evaluation function where, okay, you can enumerate this and in principle for small games, you can just roll to final positions where you just basically evaluate the score in case of God decide who has the more, more territory and you just completely unroll the whole game tree and you are fine. The problem with Go is uh, that you have a lot of empty positions where you can play. So the branching factor is actually very high and uh, you basically cannot do this. And even doing this to say level three or four is very problematic because this goes, goes up exponentially. And uh, uh, what people do, for example, in chess, where there is also this kind of problem just less pronounced, is they say, okay, I will not go to the final position, to the mate position, but uh, I will, use some heuristic position, uh, heuristic evaluation at some level. For example, I will unroll the game tree to level five, so I will look at all possible combinations of five moves ahead, and we, I will evaluate these positions, for example, based on who has the more pieces on the board. Like if black has more pieces on the board, then black is ahead, and the situation is f good for black, and black should be choosing this branch. If white has more more pieces, it's uh, beneficial for him. So the problem with Go is that until recently, no one had, no one had uh, any idea how to build such a position. For chess, actually the heuristic that I mentioned works really well. There is a lot of uh, other possibilities to improve this heuristic, but as a baseline, this just counting the pieces is something that works pretty well. But uh, in case of Go, you can have some uh, positions where uh, it's very hard to determine. For example, let's take a look at those, those two positions here. One, one is on, on a smaller board, the other one is on the large board which is used for most of the real games. So would you say, based on what I explained to you a few seconds before, uh, would you say that what's the winning probability for black and white? Who is ahead on each of these boards? What's your feeling? White on both, okay. So why is white ahead here? Like there is like, what is white's territory, right? Because because uh, because uh, black has some, some territory here, black has a group here, group here. White doesn't have that much, right? Or does he? Yeah, the black groups are weak. They are actually dead. All those black stones here, are dead because they don't have the two, two eyes that we, should, that we have shown. Like here, we have a large black group, but white can capture it anytime by playing here. And this group actually, uh, white can also capture it anytime if he chooses by first playing here, then capturing here, then filling this liberty, then eventually playing here. And there is no way that black can prevent this to make true two eyes. 
So, so actually, there is a lot of black stones on the board, but most of them are dead. And uh, in this case, here. Uh, like here. Okay, right, right. So uh, actually, I don't agree, but I'm not sure if uh, we should go to detailed analysis. But I will present a matter reason. Okay, let's say that white is it's white two place, so that we don't uh, uh, we make this less controversial. Uh, so if white is to play, then okay, this position it looks like there is a lot of black territory here. So black will, would get a lot of points in this area, and there, it doesn't look that there is a lot of uh, white territory area where white could get a lot of points at the end of the game. Uh, that's the first intuition someone could have, or a naive, naive uh, uh, evaluation function would have. But actually, what white can do anytime is play, for example, here, and then, uh, then it will threaten to capture both of these stones, and uh, black will not be able to prevent that. At that point, white can start capturing, capturing, capturing here, and this black line here is actually completely illusory, and white can capture most of this line, and suddenly there isn't any potential black territory here. So, so, so actually, this isn't good for, 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 for black at all. So, uh, the problem is that if you just look at the board statically, it's very hard to determine without any look ahead, because at this point you are in the evaluation function. You shouldn't search and consider further combinations anymore, because you are already at the leaf of the game tree. You just did that before. Uh, but it's very difficult to actually estimate this, and there is too many patterns to do some naive pattern matching and determine what's good, what's bad. And that's what, why for like 40 years, no one was able to figure a good, uh, good evaluation function for, uh, for, uh, for uh, evaluating go positions, determining which one is better, which one is worse. The best that we figured out is actually playing many random games from this kind of position to the final position. Like you play, for example, 100,000 random, completely random games from this position to a final position which you can just evaluate using, using uh, simple go rules. And if black wins most of these random games, we say this position is better for black. And this actually didn't work badly. It, it worked okay, but it had many problems still. And, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, but, the key innovation which changed Go was actually moving away from this. So one hint that uh, people could get is uh, if someone is a stronger human player, uh, he can actually evaluate positions kind of intuitively. He doesn't need to read ahead a lot. He will just look around at the position, say, hmm, 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 and in three seconds, at most, Say he can say, okay, this looks better for black and white. And of course, sometimes he's wrong and he needs to read ahead and consider some combinations, but this is actually very reliable. And for, for very st uh, the stronger the player is, the more reliable this intuitive evaluation is. So for humans, evaluating the positions doesn't, uh, doesn't rely on complex reasoning, on logic and putting things together and so on. It's just in a blink of the eye, you have some feeling. And actually, in a blink of the eye, you see often which is the best move to play. You have very strong predictor in your head, which just intuitively says, okay, now let's, let, let's look at this move. Uh, the other hint is that people actually, uh, scientists have put Go players inside MRI machines and uh, showed them Go positions and did some research did some research uh, to determine how are they thinking about the positions. And uh, almost exclusively, it was the visual cortex which was active. So for those strong players, they learned to evaluate the positions directly in the visual cortex. Okay, there is actually a popular class of neural networks which is strongly uh, inspired by the visual cortex and how that works and can in various tasks uh, approach that performance. So that's what people tried, and it worked. 
So the key innovation, which was actually parallel, parallelly published by DeepMind and Facebook AI Research back then, uh, was uh, Mm, okay, let's take a classic uh, CNN arch architecture, classic convolutional network, and uh, and try to train it to predict the next move on the board, uh, which is sort of like. And also, let's okay, we can try to uh, train it to predict whether it's black will win this game or white will win this game based on just records of games. And this was actually super successful. And just using this game without any game game tree search can produce a go player which is way stronger than me and way stronger than 95% of players, for example, maybe even more. Uh, without just just basically a computer playing intuitively, just using the neural network, which is actually a lot similar to how uh, how strong human players can play if uh, you have a professional level player versus an intermediate player, the professional player doesn't need to stop and think. He can make every move in five seconds and still reliably beat the, the weaker player if the strength difference is, is big. That's because his evaluation function, which he has in his head, is so strong that he can just rely on that and don't run any game tree search in his head. Of course, if you have two evenly matched players, they each run game tree search in their head. It's just highly selective one. Uh, so, it's uh, I won't really go into the details. Uh, these pictures are from uh, what's called AlphaGo Zero Cheat Sheet. You can Google that, and it's an excellent summary of uh, of the paper. I will at the, at the last slide I will repeat the the name which you should Google, and it illustrates basically how the whole AlphaGo Zero works. So I just take, uh, took some screenshots and crops of that, and. Uh, Basically, if you ever built any convolutional neural network, it's very similar to this. Basically, you have uh, the, the it's based on the uh, in AlphaGo Zero, which is one actually of the innovations of AlphaGo Zero. Which is why is it so much better than before? Is it uses a ResNet-like architecture, so it uses residual units. Which basically the idea is that uh, by default the network just copies the output uh, of the previous layer. And it's just trying to learn a difference, uh, basically, basically uh, what coefficients to add or subtract from the previous layer. So by default, SARTA it does identity. There is an identity skip connection there. So uh, people figure it out, even in context of image processing, that this kind of architecture is way better than many of the alternatives because uh, it doesn't basically tra transform the input so drastically. Uh, the, the gradients work better. So uh, what this does is we have this uh, convolutional, neural, convolutional neural network and the traditional one has just basically three channels, R, G, B at the input. This one has different channels. It has a channel for black stones, a binary channel, a channel for white stones, again a binary channel which has ones at the points where, uh, where, where black stones or white stones is. and. Uh, it actually has these two channels, not for the last position, but for several last positions. And they explain in the paper that it's because of the core rule, the rule which prevents, uh, which prohibits repeating previous positions. So for, in order for the network to be able to accommodate this, it has uh, to have some historical information about how the game evolved. And I think it actually also helps the network uh, a lot to, to just learn when it sees how the sequence evolved. And it often, in, in Go, it's best to play in the area where, you, where the opponent played last. Typically, you are playing out some local sequences. So it's actually very powerful information. It's maybe a bit of a cheat, but, but a small one. Okay, and uh, yeah, that's that's basically the important thing. And then you just run the convolutional neural network, many, many, many layers of convolutions, and the convolutions are learning various patterns, and then meta patterns, and more and more abstract information. And at the end, you have actually two different kinds of output from the same network, which you train at the same time. One of them just predicts a number from minus one to one, depending whether the network thinks the position is better for black or for white. And uh, the, the other one is actually uh, basically a softmax which says which are the best moves in this position. So basically it predicts a distribution 
uh, across all moves, all possible moves in that position, and it tries to predict which moves uh, are more, more likely uh, to be worth exploring and worth playing uh, in, in the game tree. So this is basically the neural network part, which the most powerful, uh, the, yeah, the, the most important thing. And uh, okay, so let's say that we did a breakthrough and we finally figured out, figured out how to how to uh, build an evaluation function. But uh, still, there is many problems with building game search because, as I mentioned. It's very difficult to actually um, do a comprehensive search of all possible positions to any meaningful depth, to explore interesting sequences uh, in depth. So there is an approach which can fix this. And uh, which was actually, this is not an AlphaGo invention, this is used in ComputerGo for like 10 years but uh, with different kind of evaluation function. So, um, and I'll mention that a bit later. So very briefly, Monte Carlo tree search, how it works. It's a different kind of game tree search where you build the game tree iteratively. Instead of just unrolling all sequences to fix the depth five or something, uh, and then evaluating all the leaves and doing the minimax propagation. And maybe you can do some heuristics which will save you some work, which is called alpha beta search and so on. But they will not help you in, in Go because it's still, uh, too, uh, still too expensive. So uh, what we do here instead, we build, the, uh, we build the tree iteratively. We start with just a single node. And uh, we do many, many iterations where in each iteration we descend to the leaf. Oops. We descend uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the leaf of the tree. We run the evaluation function at that leaf. And then we propagate, we propagate the result of this function back to the root. And we update statistics about how good each move is based on the result uh, of this evaluation function in the leaf. And at the same moment, we expand that leaf uh, to, to all its children. So what this does, uh, and when, well, while designing the tree, we are trying to select the moves which are most likely, uh, which are most interesting to explore, which roughly means that it's more, they are most likely uh, to yield a good result for the player who is on move. Uh, so what this does is uh, we dynamically grow the tree and the tree is the deepest in the direction where the most interesting moves are. So actually most of the moves are almost completely unexplored because typically they aren't really good moves to, uh, to, to, to explore. But there are just those few key moves which are worth exploring, worth, worth, uh, worth uh, considering. And those, for those moves, the sequences, the game sequences which are explored are actually really, really deep. Uh, so uh, the question then is, I just skimmed over that. I said, OK. At each position, we choose the most interesting move then to, to, uh, to consider, to explore. But how do we actually do that? I would feel bad about not including any, any formulas and equations here. So here is a token slide with formulas and equations. But I'll explain that they aren't actually that complicated. Don't worry. So the question of uh, which moves to select actually is uh, something that's a pattern which uh, arises a lot in the whole theoretical computer science, basically, and AI in particular. And um, uh, basically, it can be formulated as so-called multi-armed bandit problem. And uh, it's about a dilemma between exploration and exploitation. Uh, the, the metaphor that people typically use is, oh, you are in a casino. And you have many gambling machines, and uh, each of them has a certain static probability of winning if you put some coins in. Some of them will win in 30% of time. Some of them will give you some reward in 70% of the time. The only problem, and this number is fixed, it doesn't change over time. It's how the technicians set it up before and they don't touch it anymore. The only problem is when you come in, you have no idea 
which machines which machines give you the best reward, which give you the 30% and which give you the 70% uh, probability of getting a reward. And you are rational, and of course you want to maximize your winnings in the casino. So you need to figure out which machines are the best ones, and you want to put most of your money in those machines. And ideally you would like to do both things kind of at once, because maybe you don't even know how long will you be able to stay in the casino. Who knows? Well, before, if you figure out a good one, a bouncer will come and just move you out, of course. But we will not consider this factor in, 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 the, in, the, in the problem. So what would be your approach to this? How would you solve this if you were in the casino? Any ideas? Okay, uh, how would you estimate it? <laughs> Sorry? Uh, okay, so the idea was uh, to estimate the probability of each, each machine, uh, but I didn't actually understand uh, using some kind of distribution, but what, what kind of distribution? At the beginning, you know nothing about any, mach any of the machines. And the probability of each machine is basically it's just uh, basically a Bernoulli distribution. It's just uh, with probability x, it will give you money, and with probability minus uh, one minus x, it will give no money to you, and it will just eat the coins. And mm -hmm. well, maybe if you keep track of the number of times you use for every machine, you can uh, estimate the probability of it increasing precision. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, one idea here was to keep track of number of tries for each machine, and uh, whenever the machine is giving uh, you some reward, you are trying that machine, the, the one which you think it works the best, and if it gives you a loss, you will just try a different one. That's what you meant? Um, I, I would keep track of the percentage of uh, reward. And, uh, right. Okay, okay, but uh, th th so you just uh, keep count of some running estimation of, uh, of of this, and the moment that your estimation would go below an estimation of different different arm, you just move to that gambling machine. Basically, the problem is okay. Maybe you have a you have a gambling machine which has eighty percent probability and then many gambling machines which have 20% probability but with the 80% one you are just unlucky on the first try and then that's tough and you are wasting your time uh, so okay to uh, one very simple approach is to use so-called epsilon greedy strategy uh, which is a fancy name for a very simple strategy where mm, like uh, typically you, you will keep track of uh, how good each gambling machine is and uh, and you will typically try the one which has the best estimate so far, but in 20% of, of cases, you just choose a random one. So this way, even if you were unlucky with some of them, eventually you will reach a point where their true nature will come out, and they will come out as pretty good, and you will focus on them mostly. So epsilon is the portion of time that you are exploring, and uh, most of the time you are just exploiting the best one. So that's one possible strategy, uh, and but uh, there is actually there is actually uh, many better ones, and each real world case of the problem has a bit uh, has a, a bit different trade offs and different strategy works typically. Uh, but in general, how to think about this is uh, well, let's let's use math to think about this. For example, if you do machine learning, you are using math to actually solve the problem because when you think about it, your objective when you are building a model is to minimize the error of the model. So everything you do in machine learning and in those optimizations and so on, it's about the loss function and minimizing the loss function, minimizing the mistakes that your model model does. Here, it's a very similar principle. You are minimizing, uh, uh, basically time wasted is what you are minimizing. If you are basically, uh, basically each, if you were trying 
every of the, each of each of the nodes, you will be getting some rewards sometimes. But they will not be as good as if you were trying the best one from the start. And you cannot do this. You cannot do this optimal thing where you try, are trying only the optimal one from the start because you have no idea which one it is. But you want to minimize the time wasted. They call it trigger at appropriately. And uh, uh, basically, uh, evaluating these strategies and mathematical formulation of these strategies uh, is all about minimizing the regret. Basically, here you have, OK, this is the reward that you would get if you played, uh, if you had n tries, if you played the optimal, uh, the, if you played the optimal uh, gambling machine, you would get the optimal reward here. So this is the ideal state, and uh, and basically, uh, basically, this is this is what you actually uh, did. This sum represents uh, how many times you basically played each each of the arms, and you want to minimize the difference. So. Uh, one approach to do this, uh, there is many many different strategies, different ones than epsilon greedy strategy as well. And the strategy which is used in computer Go is to uh, basically keep the counts, the the, the, the the estimates, basically which, where you say, okay, in this position, this move helped me uh, yield a good evaluation in 50% of time, this move in 20% of time, this move in 10% of time, and so on. And uh, you, keep these, uh, you keep these counts, and uh, you continue to choose uh, the one with the best count plus some exploration coefficient. And the exploration coefficient uh, is uh, a function which slowly raises over time for all possible gambling machines but it quickly goes down with the number of tries you gave each each uh, each gambling machine. So basically, this is a function where, uh, f for all of the gambling machines, uh, this is the number of tri total tries you did, and this is the number of uh, of times this particular gambling machine was chosen. So this function slowly goes up. Uh, over time, uh, for all machines, but quickly goes quickly goes down, basically for uh, yeah, I, it's actually this, okay. <laughs> uh, the quickly quickly goes down uh, every time you choose the machine. So eventually, if you have infinite time, you will uh, the, 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 uh, for for good moves. Uh, this uh, even if you were unlucky at the beginning. Uh, eventually, this coefficient will 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 raise high enough that that you will uh, finally finally figure out what the true reward is and start it uh, start exploring it. And uh, what goes here actually another thing that goes here is um, is uh, uh, what the neural network predicted. So basically, uh, what you also add in the exploration coefficient is the prediction of the neural network, uh, which basically says, OK, OK, uh, if, the prediction, if the neural network predicted that this move is good, then maybe then I will give it higher exploration uh, coefficients. So uh, how do you do this, actually? Uh, the, how do you use this is uh, you have a multi iron bandit dilemma at each at each uh, at, at at every moment while mm, searching the game tree and uh, because you don't know you don't know which of the moves is good and bad because the evaluation function the neural network is kind of noisy it's not like uh, it doesn't it's not like uh, uh, something that uh, uh, with small tweaks will not possibly create some flukes and uh, uh, even though at the beginning of searching the tree, uh, some variation looks good from the neural network evaluation. When you start exploring it and start uh, going through the combinations, it may turn out that, OK, this is not uh, such a good idea at, uh, at all, because this move can counter it. So at that point, suddenly, suddenly uh, so, uh, you would like to switch to a different variation and start exploring a different one because the evaluation function value will 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 shift so that's why we are using this it had even better motivation when we were using this with the monte carlo simulations with the random games 
which were used to evaluate the position because then it was truly noisy. But we still use it here because it turns out that, uh, that, that it works well to uh, guide the search around uh, positions which looked promising but turned out to be disproved by some sequences. Okay, so uh, that's basically how it works. Just, let's just figure out how to train it and we are almost done. Uh, so just a reminder, we, for this to make it work, we need, to, we need to train the evaluation function, which is a neural network, which just to remind you has two outputs. Basically it says from minus one to one, whether the situation is good or bad for the player to play or for black or for white, depends on how you implement it. And it has another, it has another output, which is called the policy output, and that basically says uh, what, which moves are worth exploring. Uh, for the Monte Carlo tree search. And uh, initially, this network is completely random. And if you feed it the position, it will just pew out some completely random numbers, just basically garbage. So initially, if you are using it, it's garbage, but your goal is to train it to be less garbage over time, hopefully. So uh, the, the idea is to play many games against itself. So you are Iteratively, you have this infinite huge loop which plays one game uh, of the networks against itself after another and so on and so on. Within each game, uh, for every move, you are performing this Monte Carlo tree search where you have a second loop where you, uh, in each iteration, you have a game tree and in each, each, in each uh, iteration you descend this game tree to the final positions, you evaluate them using the neural network and uh, which is initially garbage, but that's all right. You just evaluate them and it gives you some results. You propagate the results. You do this many, many, many times. And uh, then based on this, you choose a move. You do this for the whole game. And at the end of the game, suddenly you have some training data because you know for each position during the game, you know whether the game led uh, to eventual uh, win for black or win for white. So that's, that's basically your label. And uh, you also know the game search, which moves it actually focused on. And that's the training data for the policy. So you just add these positions to the training set. And uh, then what you do is uh, every many games, you sample many positions uh, from, from last bunch of games and you just train the network using stochastic gradient descent uh, for, for some for these positions, and then you decide whether this uh, the new network is better than the old one by playing some test games and seeing uh, who wins more games in these conditions, and then repeat, rinse and repeat. So you have this infinite training group where the network is playing against itself for a while, then you have some new training data because you know how it ended up, you feed it to the network, and then you play some more games, uh, with itself and so on and so on and so on. So, uh, yeah. So this is pretty much how it works. So if you run this whole thing, you have AlphaGo Zero, the program which needs no supervision. It just uses reinforcement learning, which is basically based uh, on the reinforcement is how the game ended up basically, and then you are giving this reinforcement back to the network, right? And, uh, and it just plays against itself and uh, needs no human supervision. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, this is some very simple baseline. This is actually my program, and uh, this was the strongest classical program even though it was closed source at the time, well, it still is. And then when AlphaGo started, it went this, this, this way. This is the strength of the program, by the way. It's an LO points, which is basically some kind of ranking, which predicts who wins uh, the matchups more, more likely. And uh, there, was a famous, there was a famous series of games against Lee Sedol, who is a very strong Korean player. Some consider him the strongest player in the world. And uh, he won the uh, sorry he lost the series and that was that was that is this version of AlphaGo, but now AlphaGo is even stronger. So uh, 
this version actually, which is uh, which is kind of intermediate version. It's not anymore the version published previously, but uh, it still does. Uh, basically, it's like AlphaGo Zero, but without the zero. Uh, it's basically it still uses the handcrafted features and supervised learning, but otherwise it has all the other innovations of AlphaGo Zero. So this version master. It played 50 games against some of the strongest players in the world over internet. And it won all of them. So the, there is already a huge margin between the strongest humans and this version. And AlphaGo Zero is uh, even stronger than that. So what is the ah, the LO rating, uh, that's basically, that's basically uh, a difference of two players uh, in the ELO rating can be used to predict the probability of one of the players winning. So the higher ELO rating you have, the stronger you are in the game. Wow. Okay, so as I said when I read the paper, I was really excited because it's super simple. And yeah, I am almost out of time, but don't worry, I am almost at the end. So. Um, uh, so I was really excited about this because it's literally what I just described and uh, that's actually a really simple concept. In original AlphaGo you had two different neural networks, you had huge supervised training parts and so on and uh, it would take a lot of work to actually reproduce that, even though many people still tried. Uh, but uh, AlphaGo Zero is a super simple concept where you are just uh, just uh, generating training data for a single neural network on the fly. You retrain, you generate more training data, so, and so on. It's really a simple concept. So that's what I did. I, I just implemented implemented that. Uh, the problem is getting it to work because someone computed uh, that. Uh, yeah, for with ordinary, ordinary GPU, you would need uh, 1,900 years of an, on a single GPU to basically run it through the same number of games as uh, the original AlphaGo team had. So there is a bit of a mismatch in the computational capability of Google and me. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, uh, just to verify, uh, but, but I would be actually happy to just verify that it kind of works for me. So, uh, I just made it easier for myself, because the original version uses the full-scale Go board, which is 19 by 19, uh, 361 intersections, and instead I just used the uh, smallest sensible board, which is 7 by 7, even smaller than the typical small board, but it already can contain some meaningful games, and uh, uh, it's not a situation where the first player to play always wins or anything crazy like that. It's, it can be reasonable to play there already, even though it's slightly imbalanced, but not, not, not by a lot. And uh, the other thing that I changed is I made the training curriculum much more aggressive. Basically what AlphaGo does is first it plays the initial 25,000 games and then it does the first training iteration and so on and so on. It's like uh, the start is very slow and that actually may make sense to make it uh, avoid some local optima and so on. What I did instead was I wanted to start doing something a bit meaningful as soon as possible. So I retrained it after every single game I put every, uh, each of the games twice actually to the network to help it train and so on. And I did this much more aggressively, but the basic idea is still the same. It uses no human handcrafted features, it uses no human games, it just learns the game from first principles, from scratch. And it kind of works uh, against the basic baseline, the weakest one in the graph before. Uh, with a small number of simulations, it sometimes can actually win. With a lot of simulations, it can win more than in 50% of time. Those samples are really small, so it's like not, yeah, it can be in theory statistical fluke, but if you look at these different trials, it's unlikely that it is one actually. And uh, yeah, I did another trial with 8,000 simulations, which isn't here, but it's similar. And uh, it's difficult to get 2020 here because black has some advantage on the board that I chosen. Uh, so, uh, so, so even if the players were evenly matched, uh, yeah, it's like it has some statistical imbalance. But uh, what I think is interesting uh, was someone asked me if my neural network, which is like really big, it has number of large number of parameters. If the neural network just isn't memorizing every position 
and just like, yeah, trying to remember what works, what doesn't, and then just, yeah, using that instead of actually generalizing the knowledge and uh, learning the basic principles. And I think the fact that with a rising number of simulations, that means with a rising number of evaluations you make, actually, they should say evaluations, not simulations, because we aren't using Monte Carlo anymore. I'm just used to it, sorry. Uh, uh, it actually goes up, it improves, so uh, it's unlikely that it would just just uh, just memorize this, and it's likely that it's generalizing some some of the general rules. Yeah, if you want, you can. It's on GitHub. It's on open source, the MIT license, so you can take a look at it. And uh, just some just some lessons and some some points about AlphaGo and AlphaGo Zero. Uh, one of it is if you are working with any kind of visual neural networks and f for some reason you are still using some of the older architectures like AlexNet uh, or VGG or something, uh, at Rossum we already saw in many instances that moving to a residual-like architecture improves performance a lot. So if accuracy matters to you, try residual units, try ResNet-like architecture. It, and it helped AlphaGo really a lot as well. AlphaGo improved by a huge chunk by just moving to this residual architecture from uh, older ones. Uh, one surprise there is that AlphaGo games, the Z AlphaGo Zero games, actually look like human games in general, which isn't obvious because it never saw human games and it discovered everything, all the high-level strategies, all the high-level shapes, all the high-level sequences from first principles by itself. And it would be in principle possible that it would find a completely different optimum from what humans did. But actually what it's learned, even in the very abstract opening sequences, were the same high-level position and same high-level moves that people do. Of course, it's stronger than people. So in some more advanced tactical positions and strategical positions, it would choose moves which are surprising to, to, to humans, but superficial it's still very human-like, which was kind of surprising to me. It wasn't obvious that this would happen, that humans actually had any idea how to play Go properly. And uh, another thing that's interesting is, actually, the Monte Carlo tree search has many problems. For example, it has no transpositions. If you just swap the order of two, you need to uh, discover uh, all the sequences uh, again, and there is many problems with connected with this. And AlphaGo Zero still uses this kind of primitive game search. So, if it's stronger than humans, its neural network actually has to be much stronger than humans, even more than the nominal difference is, in order to overcome these weaknesses, which humans can overcome. Humans can realize, okay, this is uh, the, just a transposition and it will say, end up with essentially the same position. But the Monte Carlo tree search used in AlphaGo cannot do this. So the intuition that it's learning is actually even stronger than human intuition than the strength difference would suggest, which I think is pretty exciting. But uh, AlphaGo Zero is still very narrow, very, very narrow application of, uh, of AI. And I think personally that it's much more general than, for example, Deep Blue from IBM, which has beaten Kasparov in chess many, many years ago. Uh, and uh, it, like, it had some contributions to AI, but it's, uh, uh, those contributions weren't really that big. And, but I, uh, and I think that uh, AlphaGo is more general because uh, it's uh, improvements in neural networks and also in the game, game search and in reinforcement learning in general are just applicable more widely than deep loop, but uh, it's still super limited because it, uh, it can learn how to solve a game which is uh, fully observable, which has still fairly limited, uh, uh, fairly limited state space and uh, where you can still effort to uh, try three million times until you get it right, which is difficult if you have, for example, a robot trying three million times. Might not be practical 
if you want to get to some results in the in your lifetime and so on and so on so i wouldn't like overwrite it and there is a great uh, great uh, write up by uh, andre karpathy called alpha in context which i really remember reading which basically yeah just put it to the ground a bit and the alpha go zero it points out seven fundamental limitations of alpha go and AlphaGo Zero solves one of them. So there is just six of them now. Six to go. Well, maybe soon. OK, sorry for this horrible color. Uh, thanks for your attention. Uh, if you want to take a closer look at this, uh, you can look at Rosum AI's Nochi project on GitHub, uh, which is this re-implementation re of AlphaGo Zero. Uh, Google out the AlphaGo Zero cheat sheet, which is great one page one huge page summary of how AlphaGo Zero works. And yeah, I re recommend again to read the AlphaGo in context post. Thanks. Thank you, and we have uh, some time for questions. So if you have some, I will just pass you the mic. Okay. Uh, I'd be interested whether you, as a Go player, could or did learn something new from like watching uh, the games the computer played. So, not in case of Nochi, because I'm not that strong, but I'm still much stronger than Gnugo is the opponent, the test opponent I used for Nochi. But uh, I think I learned from my original program, Pachi, which could have beaten me in some cases, not always, but it had a good chance of beating me. It, it, it taught me something about Go, certainly. Hi. Uh, can you sum up uh, the innovation from, from AlphaGo Lee to AlphaGo Master? Like, what is the main trick that, uh, that uh, AlphaGo Master mm -hmm. did? Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, basically, uh, the difference here is it moved uh, f to the residual convolution neural networks, the convolution neural networks with the residual units. That was a huge improvement. And the other one was moving from two different neural networks, which were kind of interlocked in some complex way, to just a single one, which uh, gets the position information, plus some, in that case, it was still some handcrafted features. Uh, and uh, it outputs both the evaluation and the distribution of moves to consider. So this was already in AlphaGo Master. So that was this jump, basically. Uh, I would like to ask uh, on your first slide where you have the training curve. Mm -hmm. um, do we know what happened? I think it was uh, yes, around hour 40. There is a jump. Uh, do we understand <laughs> what, what it learned? And also the regime kind of changed. Uh, right, yeah. It's, there is kind of a funny jump there, right? Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but uh, I have a certain hypothesis because uh, what they mentioned is um, there is a certain uh, situation, and yeah, I'm not sure if I, yeah, I have it here. Uh, there is a certain uh, basi very basic tactics in Go, which is called ladder, schody in Czech. It's a different word, I don't know, but it's just, it works this way. Um, and basically, it, uh, uh, the way it works is if black is to play, and wants to save these stones, it would be intuitive to just play here, okay? It's just escaped, almost. But what white can do is white can go here, black escapes again, and white goes, goes there, and basically what white can do is white can capture those stones no matter how, how black tries by just repeating the same pattern again and again and again. And uh, for humans, this is something that beginners learn as one of the first most basic tactics because it occurs really frequently. And the stronger player can set up this very quickly when he knows about this. But uh, this is something that's very hard for the traditional computers if they don't have a specific heuristic for this because it's like super deep uh, combination of moves. And uh, it's really hard to just meaningfully automatically search for it. Yeah, because like, yeah, uh, how, do you, how do you figure this out? Because you would have tendency to always also consider the older alternative move and other alternative moves, even though human would always consider just the next one move unconditionally. And this is a phenomenon which, uh, uh, which uh, Google and DeepMind team reported that uh, during self-play, uh, AlphaGo Zero uh, figure, figured out really late 
Because in AlphaGo Zero, if it plays against itself, if it would play against another player, uh, the other player would quickly learn to exploit this weakness of not knowing the letters. And AlphaGo Zero would uh, be forced to learn it pretty early. But, but uh, because AlphaGo didn't know about the letters at all, for a very long time, it didn't know about it at all. And I think that's what happens, uh, that what happens, that's likely what happens here, I think. Because uh, suddenly, if it discovers this concept, then it can beat the, the older version in very high percent of time. And they mentioned that it, would, it took something like uh, uh, two days or something crazy, uh, or even more, to actually discover this very basic concept. Uh, maybe, but actually, if you matched it against Lee Sedol, it wouldn't, it wouldn't beat him. Because this is like, a, it's just a number based on some measurements against some proxy players, and then you like compute, you assume that the players mm, just sort of, uh, one of the players is sharply better than the other one, but actually in practice, one of the players is stronger in one aspect, another is in another aspect, and this one number is kind of inaccurate. So if you did the matchup in practice, Lee Sedol would certainly beat, uh, beat the, the exploit this vulnerability. But uh, but in all other aspects, it would be better than Lisa Do. It is well known that uh, convolutional neural networks for image recognition can be fooled easily. I'm just wondering if a similar strategy can be used for uh, beating this algorithm. Yeah, that would be a, a very interesting thing to try. And uh, so far, what's unfortunate is that we don't have uh, like. Uh, AlphaGo as a service or anything like uh, people cannot really play against it intensively and try to figure out those loopholes and so on. But we know that, for example, in chess, this uh, this was happening. Like the, pro the chess program would be already much stronger than humans, but it would have this specific weakness which the humans would learn to exploit. And then there there, there, was, there had to be a better version of the chess program fixing this weakness. So it's pretty likely that AlphaGo, if uh, people were free to play hundreds and thousands of games against it, would figure out some weaknesses. But uh, uh, in the public matches and in the opportunities we had. I don't know about any reports of that yet. Uh, you mentioned that uh, that uh, AlphaGo Zero uses 40 layers of the of the convolutional neural network, mm -hmm. right? Uh, do you know uh, why or how, how the programmers arrived to this number and right. uh, if they have tried to explain it uh, in some way that makes sense to humans? Uh, so I think the story here is if you read the actual paper from Nature, which you, which is actually kind of open access and there are links on the internet where you can, even though Nature, you typically have to pay big bucks to get to the paper, there are ways to get to it for free. Uh, if you read the paper, uh, actually it's kind of fuzzy and complicated because first they started with just 19 layers. And for me, the logic here is it's 19 by 19 and you will use 19 layers. That kind of works nicely. And then they, uh, uh, yeah, it likes, yeah, it makes sense to me. Like uh, in the 19 layers, because they actually use three by three convolutions, the, the 19 layers is enough to propagate from one corner to the other, right? Uh, uh, but uh, uh, then they just, uh, at the end of the paper, they say, okay, and now we try and uh, train a stronger network, which has double the layers and also much more time. And those are the final results. So I think they started with 19 layers and then just doubled it and maybe round it up by two for to 40. <laughs> That's my hypothesis, but no one truly knows. <laughs> uh, thank you for the lecture. Um, as I understand, uh, this ver version applies for the black and white, uh, right? Uh, like it can play for any uh, type of opponent, uh, black or white. Actually, actually, it's the same network which uh, yeah, just yeah, yeah, yeah. determines the best uh, move for the player to play. Yeah. 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 So, uh, did they try to uh, simulate many games and find out what is the commi or the advantage of the uh, first player beginning? Right, right. I didn't mention it explicitly, uh, but basically, if you have this board, then if you have the advantage of the first move, it's actually really an advantage and you can win more games if you go first. So, what people figured out, they figured it out relatively late, only in the 20th century, no idea 
why not before, but uh, they, they, they started using so-called commi, and that means that the second player to play, which is white in, in Go, uh, gets uh, some point compensation. It's uh, typically 7.5 nowadays. So the black has advantage of first move, but white has advantage of 7.5. And uh, uh, yeah, it would be interesting to figure out how, what's the true value, because this is just a human estimation where they figure out, okay, if we do this, it's 50-50 in professional games over some time. And uh, I think uh, there was no mention of this in the, in the paper uh, from Nature. I, my, my player, Notch is still too weak to reliably determine this, I think. Uh, but uh, in general, it's, uh, it seems from past results that, uh, that 7 or 7.5 is a pretty fair one. The point five there is just to break ties. Thanks. And uh, another thing came to my mind: uh, is, was, is there a large, or like, uh, does the algorithm exploit the opponent a lot, or uh, is there some statistics uh, if uh, it uh, wins by a large margin of points, or is it just a close uh, win? Typically, what happens is that one of the players uh, resigns. Basically, w what happens is uh, you have this kind of estimate, and when that estimate, uh, the ideal this estimate is somewhere, uh, if you have minus one versus one, for where it's win for each player, uh, typically the estimate is close to zero, or minus o point one or plus 0.1 or something. Uh, but if it goes to, the, mm, the, the, to some extreme, like, 0.9 or something, then uh, typically if the function starts being reliable, you can just decide, okay, it's not worth playing further because uh, for sure this one player will will win. And the 7x7 seven seven board is not very representative here because it's easy to just capture all the stones uh, of the opponent, much easier than on larger boards where it's more likely than that uh, the, the, the game will be even. <laughs> Okay, I have one more question for me. Uh, did you use all 40 layers of the of the network for your? No, no, no. Uh, yeah, that's another optimization I did. Uh, is I said to myself, okay, they did 19 by 19 with 19 layers initially, so I'll do seven by seven, seven by seven with seven layers, and that, that's what I did. By the way, how many parameters it was altogether? Do you know? Uh, I don't think I. Yeah, I think it was on the a uh, few millions, but I am not completely sure right now. Uh, you mentioned that uh, that in AlphaGo Zero they uh, played uh, many matches initially uh, in one batch before training the the network to avoid uh, getting stuck in some local optimum. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Basically. Uh, yeah, okay, continue. Uh, and uh, do, did they also describe in the paper what such local optimum uh, may look like, or do you have some idea what, what it may look like? All right, uh, so I'm actually not that well versed in the details of the reinforcement learning. This was kind of not so big experiment for me, so I don't know all these details, but what people usually describe is uh, that basically, if, uh, during the reinforcement learning process, it's, uh, I think, even more important aspect there is to sample not just moves from the recent games, but also replace some moves from some positions from relatively old games, because it helps uh, the network not to converge to just uh, play handling specific positions, and it's basically against the uh, overfitting, basically, because you are even sampling even some very old positions from games that the, uh, that the network didn't see before, but I, it would be hard for me to go to details here. And there is actually some tricks which I didn't mention. I actually didn't mention a lot of tricks, but they are just details, so I didn't want to waste time on those, but there are a lot of tricks uh, to prevent the game from just, uh, the, the, to prevent the model from just starting repeating uh, the same game again and again, and just falling to a single attractor. There is some randomization and so on. So that's actually an important consideration. Okay, so thank you once again.